I'm going to do one quick housekeeping item before we start the presentation. And for those of you who have been in this room before, it's just to call out the fact that we know sometimes there are some sound issues in the back of the room. So if you can't hear, please raise your hand, let us know so we can address it. And you can continue to hear the presentation versus sitting there for 10 or 15 minutes and not understanding most of it. So with that, to make sure we give um, these folks the most time, I'm going to pass it off to Stephen and John. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chicago. Woo. This is it. This is the session. This is the session you've all been waiting for. I'm going to give you a quick, 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 quick overview of semantics. I'm going to give you some concrete tips on semantics performance. I'm going to illustrate those tips with some case studies. And I'm going to pass on to John Snelson. John is the lead engineer for semantics and SQL. I'm product manager for semantics and SQL. So let's get going. Introduction, semantics. What is semantics? Semantics is a new way to organize data. So data is stored in triples, generally RDF triples. Triples are expressed as subject, predicate, object. An example of a triple is John Smith lives in London. Another triple is London is in England. As you get more and more triples, the triples chain together or graph together, form together in a graph due to the magic of IRIs. The subject and the predicate in a triple are always an IRI. The object may, on, may be an IRI or maybe a typed, typed value. Uh, you query with Sparkle. Sparkle is the standard language that, uh, that, that was built to query across RDF triples and RDF graphs. And it gives you simple lookup and more. For example, uh, it, with these two triples, any human being reading that would know that John Smith actually lives in England. And so due to uh, some of the, the intricacies of Sparkle and the magic of inference, we can do queries like find people who live in England, find people who live in a place that's in England. Uh, we can infer that John lives in England even though we don't have a triple that says that. Okay, So that's semantics in a nutshell. MarkLogic does semantics. MarkLogic is a triple store. MarkLogic is a document store. The great power of having the two together is that you have both in the same place, both in the same database. Uh, both, are, uh, both take advantage of the same enterprise features of security and backup and high availability, disaster recovery, and so on. Uh, sometimes. It's, it's a good thing to have triples alongside documents, and the fact that they're in the same place is a benefit in and of itself. For example, semantic search. Uh, a lot of our customers use semantics to expand the query terms they're using, expand those query terms into concepts, use those concepts as input to a regular document search. Uh, they get a much better quality search. So having triples alongside documents, that's already a benefit. But wait, there's more. Documents can be part of the graph. Because in MarkLogic, you identify a document by its URI, its database URI, that URI can be the subject or the object of a triple. And so we can do graph queries whose results are documents. So we can have documents take part in that graph query. We can have metadata from a document expressed as triples. And through the magic of templates, which I hope you've heard about already this week, new in MarkLogic 9, uh, metadata can be expressed in the document and also indexed as triples. So that metadata as well can be part of that graph query. We can use semantics for data integration. Uh, you've, you'll have heard a lot about entity services this week. Um, one of, the, one of the things that we can do with triples is to build a semantic model of your data. So tell me, tell me what this data actually means. Um, in the realm of integration, what that means is, let me, let me try this. Uh, try out the laser pointer. No. Ooh. I'm always surprised when those things work. Um, so I can say that this kind of a document which is part of a graph. This kind of a document talks about vendors. And the place in this document that I find vendor information is this vendor element. 
This other kind of document is very similar. Uh, it talks about sellers in the seller element. And this one's very different, but it also has a notion of a provider in the prov element. Now, if I express these things as triples, now I know more about my data. I know more about the meaning of my data. I had a couple of triple, triples here to say that vendor and seller and provider are equivalent. And bingo, I can do a search for vendor, and I can find it anywhere in any of these documents because I know that these things are the same, and I know where these things are stored in each of the documents. Okay? So that's triples alongside documents. Documents as part of a graph. Graph as part of the document information, the document semantics. What if we intertwingle triples and documents? Anybody know what intertwingle means? Nobody. Catch me offline. I'll, I'll tell you what intertwingle means. We can mingle triples and documents in two ways. So this is a document. It's in XML. It could just as easily be in JSON. An XML document with embedded triples. So some of my metadata, for example, I might want to play a part in my graph traversal. So I've embedded them right there in the document. They have the same security as the document. I delete the document. They go away. Uh, I back the document up. They go with it. And kind of upside down of that, here are triples that are decorated by document information. And we'll talk a little bit about this more in a, a later on. Um, but I've got my embedded triples. And then I'm saying something about the triples, things like the providence and the conf confidence and, and, and so on. So the fact that I can intertwingle triples in documents means that I can embed triples in documents. Um, my document information can be seen as triples, and my triple information can be annotated in a very general way in a document. So that was, the, that was the, the introduction to documents and triples together. I'm going to talk a little bit now about semantics performance at scale. Uh, credit to these guys who uh, helped put together these real case studies, Balvinda, Ed, James, and Tom. So a side note before I dig into this, um, semantics, a semantics problem isn't always a scale problem. Um, if we're doing something like semantic search, where I'm using semantics just to expand search terms, uh, kind of by its nature, that's a, that's a very small, very well-scoped problem. Um, if I'm talking about all the different words for parts of an automobile, for example, I'm not going to have billions and billions of triples. Okay? But so by its nature, that's a smallish, more well-scoped problem. And so I can, I can afford to be more generous when I'm talking about things like joins, and inference, and so on. If I am doing sem semantics at scale, tip number one, overarching tip, use Mart Logic. So you bought Mart Logic, you paid for the license, thank you very much. Um, use it. Don't pretend that it's a triple store and pretend that it only does the things that all the other triple stores on the market do. Um, use Mart Logic security. Use Mart Logic partitioning through things like connect collections. Use Mart Logic search. Use Mart Logic search for filtering and projection. Don't treat Mart Logic like a dumb data store. Um, and this applies to pretty much anything you do with Mart Logic. Don't just pull everything that might be relevant into the middle tier and then use your Java program to do all the filtering and projection and, and uh, aggregates and so on. Uh, that's not a good way to make full use of your MartLogic database. Second overarching overall tip, query. And you'll hear this over and over and over again as we talk about performance. Trim the results set early. Um, so whatever kind of a query you're doing, do that query over as small a result set as possible. Uh, paradoxically, quite often a very complex query will run faster than a very simple query because it's very targeted. And we're very good, thanks to people like John, we're very good at looking at those complex queries and getting right to the answer very, very quickly. So trim the results set early. If you think about it, this is sort of like in the relational world doing 
saying not, not to do a select star from table. Right? If anybody's ever dealt with a relational database, you don't ever do a select star from table because you don't know how big the table is going to be. It's going to take forever. Um, in fact, it's worse than that. With a triple store or a document store, you're actually saying select star from everything, from the whole database, from every table you know about. Uh, so see notes on partitioning. Um, once you get into the advanced stages, if you go into very high scale, uh, you can get smart about keeping light triples in the same document. And so you, there are some tricks that you can play that we'll, we'll see in a bit. OK, the next overarching tip, use documents for entities, triples for facts and relationships. That's the mantra that everybody should have. I'm, I'm tempted to have everybody chant along with me, but I won't, I won't do that. Documents for entities, triples for facts and relationships. Um, it's better that way. It's more efficient. With, with the document model, you're keeping all the information about a particular entity together. And you're reducing joins on both query and retrievable. retrieval. Um, if you have a record, like, for example, a customer record, keep all that information in the same document. You can take that document, you can split it into its atomic particles, its triples. You can scatter those triples to the winds. And then every time you do a query, you do a massive number of joins to find that customer again. And then if the query says, show me the customer record that, then you do a massive number of joins to plaster that together again, deliver the document. Don't do that. Just keep the customer as a document. So use documents for entities, triples for facts and relationships. Um, and again, we can play some clever tricks if we know how and where the triples are stored and exactly what the relationships are with to, to the documents. Um, here's that in diagrammatic form. Um, so Sam Shady is a document. This is all, all the things we know about Sam Shady. He's a member of this organization. This is the document that tells us all we know about this, um, this organization. But the fact that he's a member of the organization, that organization claims credit for this event, means we can do inference. We can say that, therefore, Sam Shady is suspected in this event. Okay? So we don't have to go all triples on the one hand or all documents on the other. They're very complementary. Inference. So inference is very powerful, very convenient, but it can be expensive. So three tips around inference. Again, scope the query. Do inference over as small a set of triples as you can possibly manage by scoping the query. Number two, consider Sparkle-based inference. Quick example of that, um, very, very simple. Um, I'm saying that here that this, this subject is of type trade. Uh, by inference, I can look all the way up the tree and to say it's of type trade, and anything that's a subtype of, anything that's a subtype of, I can do that through an inference rule. But if I do it right there in the sparkle, it's much more targeted. It's much less general. And, in, and most of the time, it will perform much better. So consider sparkle-based inference for the very simple cases like um, subclass of. So consider sparkle-based inference. Consider materialization. So. Um, it's, it's not a terrible thing to, to materialize the inferred triples that you use most often. So your, your inference rules look very much like Sparkle Construct. Sparkle Construct will give you back a query. You insert that in the database. The triple's already there. Uh, you don't need to do, to, to do inference. Okay. So just a couple of pages of uh, more detailed tips. Uh, we talked about using, we talked about scoping the query. Use mark logic indexes to scope the query. The magic of mark logic is in its indexes. Um, do a collection query or a sparkle from to partition the RDF space. 
um, put ontologies and other lookup mapping type triples into their own graph, into their own collection. Uh, that way, if you know you're looking for something that's in a small collection, you can target the query that way. You can scope the query that way. Um, consider pushing down some of the Sparkle filters to the document, to a document query. Uh, and look for things that can be materialized. So look for some of those joins where you might be able to materialize a triple and do away with that join. Think of this as, as denormalizing the triples. It's, it's kind of the, um, the, the, the parallel to denormalizing in the relational world. Okay. More detailed tips. Um, project the result. So once you've done your query, you want to project the result to return it to the user. In some cases, it's much more efficient, efficient to project that result using Sparkle. And the reason for that is when, when, you do, when you do a Sparkle query to get the final result, it's getting it out of the index. It's not going back to a document. So for smaller re result sets, um, use Sparkle, get it directly from the index. For larger result sets, again, go to, go to the documents. Don't do Sparkle to, to reconstitute a document and then pull it off of disk. If you need to get the whole document back, if you have large result sets, do the projection from, from, uh, from a document search. So you know, get me the customers that, get me the orders that, get me the patients that. Uh, that way, when you fetch the document, you're going back to the disk, but you're fetching the whole document, often in a single read. And I think this is the last uh, page of, of detail tips. Use the latest version of MarkLogic. Um, again, John and his crew are working very hard to, to make Sparkle more efficient, more performant in every release. That's major releases and minor releases. Uh, add more memory, add more hardware. Um, I, I get calls all the time that say, I've got billions and billions of triples, and I'm doing this really complicated query, and it's taking too long. And, well, what kind of hardware have you got? Well, I've got a VM that's 8 gig of memory, and it's a spinning disk. And add more hardware. Uh, MarkLogic is, is very scalable. It's horizontally scalable. Um, it makes use of more memory if you give it to it. It makes use of more nodes if you give it to, give it, to it. So if you add more memory, the optimizer can choose faster execution plans. If you add more nodes, it can do more parallelization. Um, Reuse queries, just, just like in SQL. Uh, you use, uh, use binds in SQL to keep the, the prepared query in cache. Do that in Sparkle as well. Um, use Mark logic built, built in functions in Sparkle. So um, there's a whole library of built in functions that you can call directly in Sparkle uh, that'll give you very good performance. And this, this, is, this is one of those sort of show specials that you will only hear about here. Um, this is not in the documentation yet. Uh, we're hoping to make it, make it into the documentation in 902. Um, we've added a switch for, for dedupe off. Um, basically, the, the, Sparkle, the Sparkle spec says the, the RDF graph is a set. And so there are no duplicates. You say the same thing twice. There aren't two facts. There's only one fact that you've said twice. In MarkLogic, if you say the same thing twice, we store it twice. You may have different security on it. It may have different annotation, different provenance, and so on. Uh, but when, before we return the results of the query, we have to strip out all those duplicates. If that's not important to you, either because you know you don't have duplicates or you've done something else with the result, you can turn dedupe off in, we think, in 902. And that might save you a huge amount of time. So what these somewhat obscure pictures are saying <laughs> is that we've looked at the tools. Now we're going to see those tools in action with a couple of case studies. Uh, the company names have been obscured, but these are real projects. And as I say, those, uh, the consultants that I listed at the beginning worked on those projects, did experiments, got real timings, and uh, developed that list of tips out of it. 
Uh, and don't, don't take too much time. Notice over the query timings, they're, they're really just for, for comparison. First case study is an educational publisher. Uh, they have a, uh, a metadata repository um, to store metadata about their digital products. And before this exercise, some of their Sparkle queries was, were, were running very slow. Um, our consulting folks went in, did a four-week exercise, and saw performance improvements of up to 100x. They have six million triples. The first query we're going to look at is find the triples where the object matches something. Okay. Um, it's a fairly complicated query. Here's the query itself. Uh, they have a, a regex filter here, a language filter, um, a not exists in a non-searchable graph, uh, which they use to filter out things that they, uh, they don't want people to find. Then they do a union on a bunch of B nodes. Uh, then there's an authorization filter here based on shackle. So it is a, it is a fairly complex query. There's six million triples. And the first query we looked at was find the triples where some object matches a regular expression. And initially, that query took 20 seconds on the hardware they were using. Uh, we put in CTS Contains, which is a mark logic built in, instead of regex, which is the standard Sparkle function. Um, brought the time down to seven seconds. Used a collection query to partition the space, partition by collections and graphs. Uh, that brought the timing down to three seconds. Then used a CTS query, a document query, to, to further scope that, that Sparkle query um, and brought the, brought the query time down to 0.4 of a second. So over, overall improvement, if I carry the three, 100 times. So there's just an example of the, the kind of improvements you can make by sitting back and thinking about some of these tips. Uh, next steps, we've, we've got some suggestions that we'd like to make to further improve those query times. Um, they're doing a union over some blank nodes. Uh, maybe they don't realize that we introduced property paths in MarkLogic 8. And look at using MarkLogic security. Uh, so they're using, uh, a, they're using Shackle, which is a, a standard. Um, but they're using Shackle to do constraints in each query. Uh, that's rather expensive. Uh, if, you, if you need that kind of very rich, complex security, then maybe it's worth paying the price. Uh, otherwise, uh, maybe it's better to use MarkLogic security um, and get it almost free, very, very efficiently. Okay. And an, another wrinkle on security they've got, they've got a non-searchable graph. So every qu query runs a filter not exists graph non-searchable. Uh, which, which also we think is, is going to be quite expensive. The second query we looked at was a, a get. Um, fetch everything you know about x. And every time you see that, get me everything you know about x, that, to me, that just cries out for a document. If, if x is an entity in the real world, maybe you should be modeling that as a document. And then fetch everything you know about x will be a single document fetch. Um, so here, started off with six seconds, um, ended up with 0.2 seconds, a 30x improvement. The next step might be, well, whenever, whenever I see fetch everything you know about x, think about representing x as a document. So, and use TDE to index parts of those documents as triples. So look at the new features in MarkLogic 9, such as TDE. And that was a, a summary of the four-week exercise. Uh, as you can see, huge returns in the first couple weeks, and then diminishing returns after that. So we were, we were very pleased with that. Uh, second case study, a data store for clinical data. Um, so the, the data about organizations, patients, encounters, conditions, and so on comes in from lots of different sources in lots of different formats. Uh, we need to be able to track provenance because it's a clinical system, track provenance, um, security is very important, role-based access to personal information, uh, encrypting uh, the, the information on disk. 
uh, the initial approach again is let's do everything as triples because I can. I can represent everything as triples. Um, that gives us limited access to the document features, to security, tiered storage, by temporal. Um, and they did provenance, provenance and other metadata about the triples. They did via uh, a, a thing called instantiated predicates, which I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, very, very quickly, uh, if, I want to, if I want to talk about a triple, the W3C way to do it is reification, which is that. I, I invent this ugly thing, and then I say things about it. Um, they invented something that was a little bit smarter, a little bit cleverer. Um, instead of inventing a thing that refers to the whole triple, I'm going to invent a new thing that, that refers to an instance of a predicate. And then when I want to say things about this triple, I say things about this instantiated predicate. Um, this is the perfect example of absolutely tying yourself in knots in order to just use a pure triple play um, and not using the other tools at your disposal, such as documents. If I do that same kind of thing in a, in a document, triples document scenario, I can say anything about that triple in a very general way, either in XML or JSON, and I can do a query across the two. So much, much nicer than any of those, uh, those other ways. Um, so we, we're, we're now working on a, a documents plus triples approach. Um, top level entities are documents. Um, whoa. Not sure what happened in that diagram. Um, one of the nice things here is, from a data integration point of view, is they actually did the thing I was describing earlier on, which is their patient ID, they store as a triple, they say, um, HL7v3 stores the patient ID here, HL7v2 stores it here, FHIR stores it here, and, and they actually use that in their queries. Okay. And they're using a combination of document queries and Sparkle and inf inference to do their queries. Um, I, th I thought this was particularly interesting. They're using Sparkle expansion for semantic search, so they're expanding the values on the one hand. They're also using Sparkle for integration, so they're expanding the locations. So two different kinds of ontologies, two different kinds of Sparkle expansion, both the values that you're searching for and the place in which you're searching for it. Uh, there's the, the, the actual query. Um, and they started off with 300 million triples. And that's one of the things that happens when you go for the pure triple approach is the number, the sheer number of triples just tends to explode. Um, initially, the, with the triples only approach, their, their query was taking 45 seconds. Uh, they rewrote the triple queries, did some materialization, brought it down a little bit. But then when you add documents into the mix, when you start modeling your, your entities as documents, you bring down the number of triples dramatically. Now we've got 30,000 documents and only 22 million triples. And now you see the, the query time come down dramatically as well. So it's an improvement of 65x. And they, they now have access to additional functionality, such as by temporal, which, again, because this was clinical information, was very important to them. They could save more and more versions of, uh, of each of their documents. Um, they could query at a point in time, and so on. OK, and this was, this was an aggregate query. Same kind of deal. Um, you start off with a query that takes a long time. You do the best you can in the triples universe. You throw documents into the mix, and you bring the timing down dramatically, 55x. OK, and this is just a, a placeholder, um, a leading global bank using uh, triples to track uh, technical assets. They have 2 billion triples. And if you come along next year, we'll go through the case study for that. So the summary is, and, and, and I'll just imagine you're standing up and shining this along with me. Use documents for entities. Use triples for relationships and facts and things that are naturally graph shaped. You don't have to choose just one. You can choose the two together. Because they go together like bacon and eggs. 
Okay, and with that, I'll hand it over to John Snelson. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, what I wanted to do is just get uh, a bit more technical and start looking at what happens when, when Sparkle executes. Um, and look at first look at how you'd investigate what a query is doing. Um, hopefully, I'm going to equip you guys, uh, possibly by going back and reading the slides again, but hopefully I'm going to equip you guys with the ability to do this with your own queries. Uh, I'm going to look first at a well-behaved query. Okay, so when we've looked at this, we'll know what to expect from a well-behaved query, and we'll be able to spot when that's not happening in a query. So uh, this is a very tiny data set. It's really only for uh, being able to show you what's going on. Uh, it's actually a graph of uh, the relationships of all the Kennedy family here. Um, so we're looking for a person um, who was born in a place called uh, Vienna, although which is which is Vienna if you if you don't speak uh, Austrian. Um, anyone know which Kennedy was born in Vienna? Arnold Schwarzenegger married a Kennedy. He was born in Vienna. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so. What we want to do, uh, when we're going to execute that query, we run through a few steps. Okay, we're going to parse the Sparkle query first, just to understand it. We'll produce an initial query plan. Okay, then that query plan will get passed through the cost-based optimizer, and that will improve it and produce an execution plan. That's what we're actually going to run when we run the query. Um, that gets cached as well. If you want to see the query plan for your queries in Sparkle, there's a number of ways to do that. This feature has been around since SmartLogic 7. I've tried to use this, uh, this annotation up here to tell you which versions which things are available in. The top line is available in every version that's had semantics. So that's, you know, that will work, but we've added better options as we've gone along. Um, for instance, in SmartLogic 9, um, there's, this, uh, there's an addition. That trace flag is just renamed for better clarity. This one is a better option. If you run some Sparkle or XDMP SQL, you can now add an option that says trace equals XXXX. You can replace that with whatever string you want. And that will produce, but all of those options there produce logging um, in, the, in the database log. Uh, but with trace equals XXXX, you will see that string repeated in your log, so you'll be able to tie specific log entries to exact points in your, in your query um, where you ran that. Um, and coming up in 902, um, it, there'll be a couple of new functions as well, so that from Query Console, you can just run those functions and get the plan back as a result straight away. In case you don't know how to use trace flags, if you go to the Mark Logic uh, admin UI, you'll go to the groups, and you'll go to diagnostics on that sidebar, and then you'll fill in the values here. And make sure you turn on this Boolean at the top. Make sure it says true, not false, otherwise uh, you'll be confused because it won't work. What that produces in the log is something that looks like this. Now, the, the format is a tree structure. The names and things that are in it are the same, but uh, what we've changed in 9 is that's coming back as XML or uh, indeed it can come back as JSON. Um, but I'll be looking at the XML version. Um, but it, if you're using MarkLogic 8 or you're using MarkLogic 7, it will look a little bit different, but the terms in it will still be the same and it will still, still form a tree, uh, the plan that we're gonna execute. I know that's a little bit hard to read, so um, actually that's not a lot better to be honest, but maybe a bit better. This is the, uh, this is the same thing from the logs, just cleaned up with no timestamps. But it actually, uh, this is a kind of graphical representation of it. This is the, this is the query plan as a tree. And uh, if I just zoom in on a couple of things to, to point out to you, the first thing to look at is uh, this is the set of joins. So you see there, there's a triple index box for each of the patterns in that Sparkle query. And that, those each represent going to the triple index and looking something up in there. And they're tied together by joins at the top there. Um, you'll notice that the joins are different types. This is a scatter join. This is a scatter join. And this is the parallel hash join. And the, the scatter joins are the things I want to draw your attention to right now. 
Scatter joins are um, their ha normal hash joins. They build, up, they build a hash table, but they do something called sideways information passing. So as they're building the hash table, they keep a record of every value for the join keys that they need. And they, they can pass that record into the next triple index lookup, and therefore constrain that next triple index lookup uh, so that it, re it, it returns far less results, only results that are actually uh, with, have a reasonable um, expectation to, to, to be joined and to produce results. Why that's important is because what we've got in the query that we looked at is we've got some selective conditions and some which could return you know, information from the whole database. So the, the term Vienna actually occurs infrequently in the database. So that's very selective. And so our first lookup here is looking up, you can't actually see it, it just as literal there, but that's the Vienna literal. Now, so that's going to return a small result set, and we're going to collect the information about which places have the name Vienna, and we're going to pass that through the scatter join into this triple index lookup. That's going to identify people that were born there. This triple index lookup feeds into this scatter join. And the, the left hand side here is always the side that we build uh, the join table from. So once we've identified the people that were born in that place, we pass those values into lookups for last name and first name. Because we don't want to go and access the last name of every, everybody's records who we've got in the database. We, it's much more efficient to access the last name for just the people that we're interested in. So those scatter joins are important because uh, when they're used, it means that we've identified a way to efficiently execute that query plan and restrict the data that we need to access. Something else to talk about, just at the top of that query plan I showed you, um, there was an order by on there. I was ordering, order by, ordering by uh, two, two fields, first uh, the first name and then the last name. Um, you'll notice that... Um, there is a num sort, this is actually an attribute in the query plan, and it's telling you that one column is already sorted. And we track the sort orders that we can get back from the indexes, and if one column is already sorted, we can perform an efficient uh, partial sort on the result based, on the knowledge, based with the knowledge that the, the major order is already there, and we just need to get the minor order correct. So we found a way to more efficiently do that sort as well. So, I talked about the, the selective condition, condition, the constraining condition here for that query, which is that one there, which has uh, the term Vienna in it. Um, if, I, I mean, I told you that that was what it was. If you wanted to discover what the more selective conditions are for your query, um, or in your data set, you could use the statistics. So there are APIs to the statistics that we use to optimize queries. Again, I'm not going to go through each of these now uh, that I've been through one set of these lists, but there's trace flags um, to turn on to get this information in your logs. And there's also a function that has existed since 8, which will return you this XML. And this XML tells you about each value, uh, each fixed value that you, are, uh, you have in your query, and it tells you what we know about it. And the thing to notice is here's the, the Vienna term and it has a count of one. You see the data set's fairly small, the total triples there is only 1,600 in this case. A lot of these occur you know, 50 times, 75 times. This one occurs once, once, and so obviously there's a lot more selective than the other terms, and that's why it's been used uh, in, on the left-hand side of a scatter join to restrict everything else in the query. There, oh, I, I did a little highlight for you, there you go. So the next thing you can do is you can then, uh, having looked at the query plan, you can follow through exactly what calls we're making to the D nodes in MarkLogic. Um, when we're making calls to the D nodes, that will be because we're doing triple index lookups. Or in MarkLogic 9, um, we can pass down more operations to happen on the D node, like grouping and sourcing. Um, so that will produce a series of these lines in your log, each one representing one message that we sent to the dnode to get results. So in the execution of the query we've been looking at, the first thing that gets looked up is 
the, the triple pattern with that Vienna string. So we know, we know that that's been executed first as it's the most selective. The second thing we look up is the birthplace. And you'll notice there's this constraint at the top. This constraint is the information that got passed from the triple pattern when we looked up Vienna. So Vienna, that identified us a place with this IRI, and that place is a constraint on the next triple index lookup. This is all really just going to prove what I was saying before. Here, the place determines some people, or a person in this case. That person is a constraint that gets passed into both the last name and the first name lookup. You notice one thing that changes here between this is last name. See this permutation? First name has a different permutation. It's doing that because it's getting the, the first name in the correct order, which satisfies our order by that we looked at, or at least the first, the, the, the major sort order for that. So now we've seen how that query executed. Let's look at this problem query. Um, and this is where it really comes down to uh, things that you might be able to look at uh, with your queries when you find that they, they you have issues. Now, it, on, on the face value, this looks like a fairly similar query. We're actually looking for people whose parent was born earlier than 1890. Okay? Now, I happen to know that that condition uh, is not served well by the statistics that we currently keep. We don't have uh, very good ways to accurately say what is less than a certain value or what is greater than a certain value. So that condition, I know, I know it's selective. I know it's only actually going to return one parent who was born before 1890. But the query optimizer doesn't know that, and that's kind of what's important when we get the query plan. The query plan now looks like this. It's fairly different. Um, ooh. Now, the only thing I really want to point out, I know it's quite small and difficult to see, but we have parallel hash join, parallel hash join, sort merge join. An assortment of different join operators there, we don't have a scatter join. It hasn't identified the constraining condition. Um, and therefore, it's going to be doing a lot of access to all the data that there is in the database. So how are we going to improve that query? One of the ways we can do that is we can give the optimizer a hint. Uh, you know, I happen to know that there's only one person that satisfies the condition that they were born earlier than 1890. So I can put in this limit. It's a subselect, really only for the purpose of the fact that I want to limit it. And I can say, since I know there's only one, I can tell the optimizer, look, limit one, there is only going to be one of these. Um, of course, if there was more than one, you would get a cutoff. So you, if the, one in this particular case is because it's a, it's a really small data set. If you had millions of, of you know, entities in your data set, and you could say, oh, this condition only, only matches 100, then a limit of 100 would be enough for the optimizer to understand that that would be a good condition to use a scatter join for. So now the query plan looks like this. Here's the limit. Uh, sorry, here's the limit. Okay, that then now feeds into the scatter join, just like the previous query used to, and another scatter join here. So we can see because the scatter joins have turned up that the optimizer has picked a better plan and is going to get access less data from the index. Another way we could solve that same problem, having figured out that we're not understanding that the less 90 condition is, is restrictive, we could add additional restrictions. So this, in this case, is the new line in this query. Now, I know that changes the query. Um, in this case, it re would return less people. Uh, a couple weren't born in Boston. Um, however, often there are conditions which you can add on which don't really change the result of the query, but they're, they're more obviously constraining conditions for that query, the statistics tell the optimizer that that's the case, and uh, they'll get used. So here, there's more triple patterns here, but you can see the scatter joins again, uh, and we're scattering from the Boston lookup, because that, we know that's a constraining condition. The optimizer has, has, has been able to figure that out. OK. Um, there's a couple of other topics I wanted to talk about. They're kind of non sequiturs, but they're, both, they're all performance 
uh, based, and hopefully they'll help you to understand some other aspects of executing Sparkle queries. Uh, the first thing you should know is that the triple index um, is not, a lot of the, the indexes in MarkLogic are memory mapped, uh, but the triple index is not memory mapped. It's, uh, it has a cache, or it has two caches in front of it. Um, and so you, um, in order to get your queries to behave correctly, the triple caches may need to be sized correctly as well. You could think of the triple index as looking a bit like this table. It's storing subjects, predicates, and objects. It's also storing document IDs and potentially positions for that triple in the document as well. Um, however, what would be closer to the truth is that there are IDs stored instead of actual values for each of those positions. Those IDs have a separate table, um, conceptually, that matches the IDs to the types and to the values that you've, you're using. This goes uh, to explain why there are two triple caches. There's the triple cache, which caches this data, and there's the triple value cache, which caches this data, the dictionary data. So those two caches are denode caches. They uh, sit in front of the indexes in the forests, um, and uh, whenever you load uh, triple data from the disk, they'll go through the caches. Um, there's, a, there's a few things. I'm not necessarily going to go through all of those bullet points. But one thing to know is that the triple caches, both of them, uh, grow and shrink. They don't allocate all of their memory up front. If you don't use any access to the triple index, they'll, be, they'll use no memory. And they, um, they kind of trickle the information out of memory. So after 30 seconds is the default configuration, pages would start getting released from that cache. Now that is mostly targeted towards kind of VM environments where you might be paying for resources that you're using or you might be taking resources away from uh, other tenants of the hardware. Um, if you're on dedicated hardware, you may just want to you know, put that timeout up way higher and it will never leave the cache, uh, in which case, it'll, you know, it, it, particularly if you have infrequent Sparkle queries, that might help you. But there's a couple of strategies for using, uh, sizing those caches. So um, one of those strategies is that, um, I mean, obviously, if you're doing a really important Sparkle queries all the time, you may want to make those bigger, um, get better performance, go to disk less often. Um, but if your Sparkle queries are a very small part of what you're doing, then equally, uh, or a, a, the SLAs on them are, are, are kind of bigger, equally you could size the triple cache down um, and not use as much memory, allocate that memory to other, other purposes. You can size for the working set, which is to say the data that you access more often. Um, and I'll show you ways where you can see what the, the triple cache is doing in a second. Um, the other thing you can do is you, it, it's feasible that you could size the triple caches big, knowing that they won't allocate that unless they really need to use it. In which case, um, maybe the triple caches are, are, you know, are ready and waiting for a giant analytical query, but your online transaction processing kind of queries, uh, you know, the, the, the ones involved in, uh, in your application, they just use a very small size and the triple cache um, stays small most of the time. So how can you find out what the triple caches are doing? Um, you can look in XDMP query meters. So that will give you cache hits and misses for the query that that's executing in. You can use forest status. So you'll get cache hits and misses for that forest over the lifetime that that's been up. Um, there's also XDMP cache status, which will give you an idea of how much data is in the cache, how much uh, space there is left in the cache, and also this idea of busy. Um, the triple caches have uh, pages pinned into them while they're being used by a query. Um, one of the things that can happen in uh, kind of very rare cases is that there could be so much querying going on that every page in the cache is pinned and busy and being used, and the triple cache, when it comes to load another page, just throws up its hands or, and says, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like, everything's being used. There's no space. Um, so that's you know, useful to know potentially in some cases. And you can look in the metering database. 
uh, all the admin UI to look at this information too. Uh, now quickly, understanding optimization. Uh, when we optimize, we use this algorithm uh, called simulated annealing. I'm not going to necessarily go through all of that, but we're looking at reordering the query, we're looking at changing the order of access to the triple index, and simulated annealing helps us to find a good plan in a constrained period of time. The optimization level is defaulted to one, and normally that gives good results on, uh, on, on kind of small to medium sized queries. Uh, but there are other optimization levels. If you have a query with a lot of joins in, you may consider turning on optimization level two, which you do with this option here, just an example of it at the bottom. There is also a mode of operation where it doesn't do cost-based analysis in the same way. It just applies a few rules, uh, heuristics, to optimizing the query. And for very small queries, or for queries that are only gonna be run once, and uh, where you're not really worried about you know, the, the, the performance so much, you might use optimization level zero. That just does the heuristics, not the cost-based optimization. Now with this, there's a trade-off between planning what you're going to do and actually doing what, you're, what you want to do. And there's really no point in spending three seconds planning to execute a query that's gonna take milliseconds one way or the other. Okay, or spending those three seconds to execute a query that you're only ever gonna execute once in the lifetime of your application. So if it's gonna be run, the query's gonna be run over and over, you know, uh, it may be worth upping the optimization level. Or if it's uh, got a lot of joins in it, it might take a long time in, 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 in the end anyway, it might be worth spending a, a few seconds up front to do it for a big analytical query like that. I, uh, under the covers in Mark Logic 9, we've really been um, doing a lot of stuff focused on performance. One of the things that's happened is that um, not only is Sparkle implemented on this engine, which I'm now calling the Optic Engine, because it, it now covers both Sparkle, SQL, and the Optic API. They're all running on this engine that uh, we've just been looking at the query plans for. We've also been able to uh, push down a lot more operations to the D node and provide more optimizations on top of, um, and in addition to the ones we already had. So for instance, you can expect to see faster order buys, uh, particularly if you have a known predicate on the, um, on, the, uh, on the index lookup which you're trying to order by. Um, faster descending order buys, faster multi-column order buys. I talked about the multi-column so, um, saw optimization earlier. The, um, the triple index can now do range-based access, which is to say it has a minimum and a maximum value to look up. And so queries that, that do ranges like that will be faster. And we've got a, a, a different grouping operator, which uses hash-based grouping, and faster disk reads, particularly on Windows. Windows operating system uh, didn't behave well with the size of disk reads that we were doing, and so we've improved that dramatically. That also improves Linux performance. So, uh, if I get my co-presenter's attention, um, what we've just given to you, uh, shown you, is uh, we've introduced semantics again, just in case you've forgotten what they was. We've talked about performance at scale and some tips to help you to work towards uh, more performant queries at, at, at scale. And we've looked at some case studies about that. And then we've looked under the hood at MarkLogic uh, Sparkle execution, uh, discussed the use of triple caches and tuning them, and hopefully you understand a bit more about optimization now too. So uh, at that stage, I just want to open the floor up to questions. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? I get to chuck a soft microphone around if you do, so. Actually, just to step in, we're kind of going into that break session. I think they can stay behind and, and ask questions, answer questions if they want. Otherwise, I think there's a 25 minute break before your next set of sessions, so. Okay, come and see me here if you have a question. <laughs> <laughs>